Thank you for being here, Stacia. We, we had a, a moment to discuss together just before, so I feel like I know you a little bit. But I will pretend that I don't, so that we can discover you. Um, so you're an American. I am. I'm a Californian, no less. <laughs> yeah, we Second can Second generation. The, the blonde <laughs> California. I should tell you, yeah. <laughs> it's natural then. Of course, uh, of course. Right. Um, you, you studied art, music, Yes. you were not an engineer. No, I didn't, uh, yeah, my, my whole education was music, composition, and, uh, and performance, and then when I finished school, I went back to California, because I went to school on the East Coast, and, um, and I taught myself software engineering. When was this? So this was 1996. Yeah. Um, so internet was not... No, this was pre-dot-com boom. So I was really, really fortunate. I landed back home, basically, at a time when it was really the Wild West. Like, you could, you could do anything you wanted to. So I would take uh, classes, computer science classes, at a junior college in San Francisco. And my professors were Stanford professors who just really liked to teach. And so I was getting this really awesome education at a very low price. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what was your first experience? Professionally? So I actually worked for, believe it or not, United Parcel Service. Um, this is my first experience in tech. So they were um, probably one of the most successful enterprises during the initial liftoff of the internet because the only way you could make money was that shipping stuff back and forth. Um, and I managed the um, integration of big databases for large shipments. Um, and it was, so it was super hacky, um, and I, <laughs> yeah, I think if I had known what I was, if I really understood what I was doing at the time, it would have scared the hell out of me, um, because we're talking about a lot of physical packages and the data that makes sure that those packages get from A to B, but it was awesome. I had a woman, actually, that was running this little innovation team inside UPS in San Francisco. And she was like, you're taking software engineering classes? I want you to be on my team, hmm. and so she really took a risk. And, um, and I'm so, f so grateful because after that, it was just, I, I knew I could go, kind of go into any environment. And maybe I didn't know everything I needed to know walking in the door, but I could learn and I could get up to speed pretty quickly. And, and your experience at Spotify was like way after, right? You mean SoundCloud here in Berlin? Yeah. Many, many years later, yeah. So after UPS, that was 97, 96, 97, 98. I then... Um, That's right, so we talked about, yeah. So I moved into online music distribution to mm -hmm. kind of go back to my music experience. So I worked for Listen.com, which became Rhapsody. Uh, I think they're still around somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's, I really got to bring like my musical background and my love of technology together um, and really like move the innovation needle in online music distribution, um, which was thrilling. I mean, this was pre-Napster. So we lived through, now. I mean, I, yeah, it was, in, it was absolutely phenomenal because nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. Um, and that was, yeah, that was the beginning of my ride. Oh, yeah. and, and how does it feel to manage uh, engineers when you're a woman? Well, I think it's, you know, it's a puzzle. Um, <laughs> engineers are people, um, <laughs> uh, believe it or not. Um, so they may not seem like it all the time. I think um, what I really love about managing engineers and what I tapped into right away was um, they're problem solvers. And they go through, we, we all go through the process of not knowing, and that's a really uncomfortable place to be, especially if, you, if people perceive that you have all the answers, right? Mm -hmm. So if you as a leader can come in and create a space where you ask questions to help people kind of uncover, A, what they don't know, and then like, what, what, what might we do to explore this problem, this part of the problem that you haven't quite figured out yet? They're really grateful for it. Um, so, I mean, we didn't call it emotional intelligence back in 1999, but that's ostensibly, you know, what I tapped into. And that actually made, you know, leading small teams at that time of software engineers really fun because I realized, you know, by creating a safe space for people to not know how to solve a problem, but to go through a path of getting there, 
um, I really gained their respect, even though they knew far more than I did. Um, it didn't. That it wasn't about who knew more. It was about how are we going to move through this process. So actually, you were telling me that manage, being a manager for you was more about um, asking questions rather than being authoritarian oh absolutely i mean that's yeah i think that's the secret is it's not about you knowing everything it's about how do you ask the right questions to help people understand where they are and what they don't know and then when people fall into uncertainty how do you help them step through that so they get through to the other side so you, you felt legitimate to do that you didn't have this syndrome no no no. no, I mean, you always sort of, you have these moments. I remember um, I was leading a team of, I don't know, around 23 people, very different uh, technologies. We were doing online video uh, distribution, and we were we were doing post-production video, and then I had software developers that had created a subscription platform, so all kinds of technologies, and I didn't know, I really understand half of it. And of course, like, you know, there there are times when there's this little nagging voice that's like, what are you doing in this room? I'm like, I, I'm willing to ask the questions that nobody in this room is willing to ask. Therefore, I have a right to be here, yeah. Yeah, being curious, being playing the naive a little bit. I think so. I and I mean, I still do. I still run into moments with my team now where they, I'll ask a question and they try to explain something to me, and I'm like, no, no, no. I know what the answer is. I want to know if you really understand and if everybody else in the room understands. So, how did the American left the country of innovation to go first in Spain? Yes. In Madrid. Yes. Yeah. How was it? It was crazy. It was probably the craziest thing I've ever done in my you life. You did it like you, 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 you were leaving your job to start your own company yeah. Yeah. first. Yeah. So this was a big shift, and the second shift was the, the cultural the, the shift. Cultural shift. Yeah. So I didn't just take one big challenge and <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> your co-founder was Spanish. Was Spanish. Yeah. How did it go? Um, it was pretty crazy. It was. It tested my resilience like massively. So the Spanish government had just uh, passed a law granting a Spanish entrepreneurship visa. And I was like, oh, surely this should be no problem. There's just some small paperwork we have to fill out, right? No, 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 no. This is not the case. So I arrive in Spain. No one in the Spanish government actually knows how to implement the visa. So I'm like, I'm starting a business. I'm not even sure if I'm going to get kicked out of here. Like, I don't know what's going on around me. So it was all these crazy, like, uncertainties. And um, at a certain point in time, you're just like, okay, like, whatever's going to happen. And what I would try to focus on was how do I, how do I apply, you know, what I have uh, in the best way possible and then just trust that the rest of it will, f will figure itself out. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the incubator we were working in <laughs> because that was very familiar to me. Um, <laughs> and I also spent time, time, trying, time trying to support other entrepreneurs that were in the same incubator space, just bouncing ideas and, and riffing off of um, yeah, their journeys because to me that was very familiar ground. And your background was making a big difference. Yeah, I mean, what we were talking about um, earlier, so when I landed there and I realized, oh my God, I've had a journey that most of these people, you know, they couldn't come close to, um, and, I, and I recognized how just small things that were really, uh, I took for granted, that I, if I could share with them was would open up new possibilities, and a lot of that was just the confidence to try things. Um, so for me, this was like this was a huge, um, a huge discovery, and it was really fulfilling. I was just happy to be there to be able to share. Yeah. So you're talking about the toxicity, what we call the toxicity. Uh -huh. In the family, we talk about the toxicity of the environment. It's cultural, it's bureaucracy, uh, it's in the infrastructure, but it can, it can kills you. I mean, it can kill your your optimism. Yeah. Right, it can drag you down, but you you can, you you found some some advantages in being so different, and you could teach around in, and sharing your experience. So this was for Spain, and then you moved to Germany. So you sold your company, and y y you landed at Zalando. Yes. So tell us about the German mindset, how it <laughs> feels to me. <laughs> the first six months I worked at Zalando, I would I would go home and be like. Why do these people hate everything? <laughs> and I'm exaggerating. I'm exaggerating. For for who is it that there's a few probably people that work at Zalando. It's not that bad. Um, I really, 
I was I was like stubbing my toe on a you know big con- slab of concrete. I would get excited about something and and bring it to the table to brainstorm with people, and they just immediately pick it apart, and I couldn't figure out why. And at some point, you know, my my bo- my boyfriend is German, and I realized it's because that's just not they need to know, and there's a tremendous amount of pressure about being wrong. And so I had to re- be very conscious of, okay, when I have an idea and it's not fully baked and I really want to brainstorm with somebody, I have to tell them, I really want to brainstorm with you right now. <laughs> so let's just, you know, put the things we don't know aside and have fun. Um, but it was hard. It was, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think if I had been younger, it probably would have, it could have thrown me off balance. Um, but I was looking around thinking, I have a lot more experience than, What's going on? Um, but <laughs> <laughs> then I recognize it's cultural. But yeah. what would you say? It's, is it like fear of failure? I mean, this is not only German. It's everywhere in Europe. Fear of failure on lack of creativity? What is it? I think it's... Um, oh, I have t- a few different hypotheses. I mean, I think a lot of... Ger- and I, and I, don't, I haven't studied how German engineers are educated, but I think they get educated around the idea that you have to have every single edge case uh, fulfilled because in the automotive industry this is th- this is the case you're talking about a physical object in space this is not the case when you're building software mm. and so the idea of being able to get most of it right and then iterate they all say that they do it but it's not in their core mm. um, so if i could change one thing it would be to like give them the freedom <laughs> to be able to do that Um, And then I think there just isn't much cultural ground to to like start from zero and and be creative and invent from the from the ground up. Um, I'm really actually interested in going back and studying German art to understand like what is the creative impulse in Germany? How does it manifest? What is it connected to in, in the culture? In terms of music, you don't feel it? I do actually. In music, I feel it. I was thinking more on the visual art side. Um, I think you know the musical history in Europe. It's well, it's Austrian and German, and they all the borders all shift all the time. So it's yeah, it's hard to say which one belongs to the <laughs> other. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I'd love to understand. And what, what is unique that if we could just tap into in this culture would actually unleash a lot of potential. Mm. Your team is not only German. You have every kind of uh, nationality. Yeah, so I have like 26 people in my team now. We have, I, we, I just got a mail that we've uh, had an offer accepted from uh, a guy from Nigeria. So he adds like country number 13. <laughs> so we're <laughs> super diverse. Um, and it's awesome because it, it really creates this environment where People have to be very aware of themselves and how they're communicating. Um, but then I also think it creates a sense of freedom uh, because you're not sitting with people that are all just like you. Mm. Did you learn things uh, working at Zalando uh, in business-wise? Uh, how do they? Are, uh, how organized they are? Those are two different questions <laughs> from Zalando. Um, <laughs> I've learned a lot about, I mean, the, the guys, I love the management board at Zalando. Um, I have an utmost respect for them. They're business people at the core. So I have learned a lot about uh, business at Zalando. I think um, the Zalando organizational structure is this, like, constantly evolving chaos that sometimes takes a shape that we recognize and have language to describe and then other times it gets really fuzzy um yeah so we're what like i don't know how many thousand people now but um i've learned a lot about uh how to think of that scale and that's really exciting because you don't get a lot of opportunities to do that and i like i said i feel really lucky to be there Mm. what's a typical day for you Um, so I get up, I have two small kittens and they wake me up at like five in the morning and (laughs) it's a really good time to actually catch up on email. Um, (laughs) and then, um, I have, you know, various meetings, uh, what's, what's cool about the role that, so I work on size and the size and fit problem in fashion at Zalando. So I not only work with, in the Zalando fashion store, but I also spend time with our private labels. So Zed labels, um, And our uh, another product called Zalon, which is a, a stylist product. So I'm running across a lot of different sides of the business, and talking with various people about okay, how do we continue moving against our strategy to really tackle size and fit? Um, but then my 
actually, I love spending time with my team mm -hmm. and really being in the detail, not to tell them what to do, but just to be there and be part of it um, and celebrate everything that we do. How would you define the difference between micromanaging and, um, and, and, and being with your team and, and, and allowing them to grow? Uh, I think it's a lot about... Um, understanding how to like where to position yourself in a conversation at any given point in time uh, and I mean it starts with listening so always listening first before you kind of dive in uh, and then being aware where are those inflection points where actually it's really important that you say something because either somebody's not seeing something critical or they're feeling insecure and they're not kind of I'm um, taking that step, and so I'm, I'm just kind of constantly scanning, and I make mistakes all the time. I mean, it's it's a topic that's really easy to be passionate about, um, but my team knows they can also just put me in check and say, we got it. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a lot also about letting them know how much you trust them um, and that uh, they, they, are, they can come to you when they need your help. Yeah. So how does it feel to be a woman in tech and who is managing mostly men, I guess? My team right now is mixed ah. bec um, because I run an interdisciplinary group, so I have business people, product design, and engineering. But I've spent most of my career mostly managing men. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so to answer your question, um, you have to find the humor in it. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, I was telling you earlier, so I grew up, playing playing music and I was often the only woman or one of few women around so I kind of figured out how to be in that and um, and make it make it work to my advantage insofar as um, understanding how to relate to men and uh, software engineers in particular because they are a special breed um, <laughs> but my like I said um, my team now has more women and there's more women actually in the organization that I'm in it it's so nice to sometimes be in a room and realize, oh, there's only one man here. <laughs> it's very cool. So, no, we, we talked about it earlier, the, this uh, a syndrome of imposter, it's mm -hmm. not your thing, but still you know that you, you had to be better. Yeah, I think there's, for, for a long time, and I mean, I don't know, there's so many women in the room, it's fabulous. Uh, I don't know if other people relate to this, but you have this sense that, um, or the, uh, and a feeling, you know, you're just held to a different standard. You're judged differently. You will be questioned. And I think that, that took me a while to really wrap my head around. Is like, how do I best prepare? Because I'm going to be drilled more likely than my male colleague. Um, and at a certain point, I just, I decided to make, f you know, make it fun. Like, okay, I'm going to rock this no matter what and actually use it to be um, to really understand what I'm talking about an even greater level of depth and really master you know, whatever it is that I'm doing. And then it's well, it's a challenge that I've chosen to take on and not this thing that's kind of happening to me. And I think that when you can make that mind shift, then it changes the dynamic. Yeah, it's cool. It's not about complaining about it. It's just about being conscious that you have to be better. We are better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, what else? I have tons of questions. I can keep on, but if you have some, you can raise your hand also. Okay. Ah, okay. Go for it. Hi. Um, so when you came from the US, it seems like you started helping others right away. When you came to Europe, did you have the chance to meet any mentors and did they play a role in your journey onwards? That's a great question. Um, not the first couple of years. I think I was really the most experienced person in the room. Uh, I, I mean, granted, I also spent time with European VCs and people from very different backgrounds that I learned from, but I didn't really connect with mentors until I got to Zalando, and then actually they were Americans that the, the management board had hired more experienced. Um, so for me, mentorship has been this really elusive thing. It's something that I think we may, maybe maybe we touched on. Um, uh, Cindy Gallup is a big hero of mine, and I think I discovered her, gosh, I don't know how many, maybe 10 years ago. Um, and in when it, it was when I discovered her, I was like, okay, she, and I know her. I mean, she, we've, we've talked a bit. Um, 
I'm like, this is what mentorship is supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like somebody that kind of looks like you. And that's when I realized I've been missing this my whole life. Um, so I think this is a really important topic. Um, and for women, it's, it's tricky because there aren't that many of us yet. But, but yeah, that's it's a longer answer than you asked for, but you're nodding, so I think it's helpful. Hey, uh, I had a question about your music part, the, the beginning of the story. What kind of music you did and what made you shift into software um, and how did that change happen? S no, that's, that's fabulous because um, it really kind of underscores the passion that drove me to dive into tech. Um, so I grew up playing jazz, which there aren't that many women female jazz musicians. Uh, um, and then I went to the Berklee College of Music in, in Boston, Massachusetts, and I was there at a time when digital technology was really starting to become prevalent and available. This is 90, 1990, 94. It changed everything. And um, while I was there, what I recognized was it was that technology that was going to, to drive the future more than me studying uh, Charlie Parker solos and John Coltrane and I mean all of this stuff that I love I really 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 love um, but my my story was going to be about that technology and it was just something I really felt at a gut level I also at the time uh, had my first dial-up modem and y all I had to do was sit with the software and the modem together and was like and, and by the way I don't need a record label um, <laughs> so I think this was the beginning of my like oh entrepreneurship like we can really do this on our own um, and so yeah I went and I lived in New York for a while and actually worked in the music industry I worked for Jive Records at the time that they were launching Britney Spears and Backstreet Boys and I was just like wow this is crazy um, and I had friends in California that had gone to a music school with me and they're like, you have to come back because um, they were all starting to work in tech. And I mean, this is, this is early. Um, and I just thought, okay, this form of the music industry is dying ostensibly and I'm gonna go take a leap. And it, I mean, it was also like going home for me. So it was a little bit um, of a, yeah, I had some, some other reason to, to dive into it. Um, you went from working in a corporate environment in, for someone, then you went to entrepreneurship, and then you went back, right? Although you said Zalando is a very dynamic company where a lot of things changing, and it's probably similar. Um, still, would you probably comment on what motivated this change? Why didn't you sustain entrepreneurship? and? What is the difference of being an entrepreneur and running a department, yeah, some area for someone? Yeah, I think it's a good question, um, particularly because I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of pressure on entrepreneurs once you've made the leap to not go back. Um, <laughs> and there's several different factors. One of it is purely financial. Um, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're struggling and you need to make a living. You know, you have to take care of that. Um, for me, I think it's always been about learning. So what I love about where I'm at at Zalando right now is I have the opportunity, because of the scale of Zalando and the customer problem that I have to solve, I'm going to learn more and I'm going to innovate more in that context, in that problem space, because of the nature of the problem and what I have access to at Zalando than I would trying to do it on my own. Um, and so you... My advice is to really clearly evaluate what is it that I want to do. I love to build things, and so I don't care whether it's a big company like Zalando or my own startup. If I get to build, I'm super happy, and if my startup is struggling because we're you know, not able to round, raise the next round of finance and we actually can't build, then I'm okay making that call. Um, but I would never suggest going and just taking another job for the sake of it. Like you really have to evaluate it because once an entrepreneur, I think always an entrepreneur, and some jobs will lend themselves to that mindset and others won't. Um, so I think the thing to be aware of is once you've done it, um, once, you've, once you've embodied what an entrepreneurship is, it's gonna make, if you end up you know, seeking another job or a job, um, a little bit harder because you're going to be pickier 
Um, <laughs> but that's great because we need uh, we need entrepreneur entrepreneurial minds in the context of corporate. Uh, it's absolute. They're not separated. We need both. Um, could you share about uh, what you love about Berlin? What oh. I love about Berlin? Oh, not. <laughs> Or not. Okay. Um, I hate the weather, uh, but that's easy, right? Uh, so I think I love the internationalism of Berlin. Like it's really, yeah. I don't. I can't imagine another. Part another city in the world where I could have work with people from all over the world. I know it exists, but I think it it gets trickier and trickier as the economics of cities changes. And I think we're at a special moment in time with Berlin. I love how rough around the edges Berlin is because I think it means that we can be not perfect. And when you talk about innovation, this is really important. Um, so I think it has a really great kind of climate for. Building and experimenting and trying new things and a very much anything goes um, idea and then the combination of technology people and artists and musicians. I mean, to me, this is exactly the ingredients. When I first landed in San Francisco, this is what was happening. Like you were never just at a party with a bunch of people doing one thing. It was always this this melting pot, and um, and there are great things that happen when that when that kind of ecosystem can take shape. I'm curious to hear more about your reflections about German creativity and what you expect you might find going into visual arts in Germany. Um, I've never <laughs> <laughs> heard that before, but I think it's extremely interesting to see what is it that can be found in the history and the culture of a country, and how does that then transfer into building new businesses in Germany? So I was sharing with Alice earlier. I'll come back to the visual art part. Um, I think. What's important from my point of view is understanding the psychology uh, of people, because once you understand the psychology, you understand why they're how they're motivated and why they're motivated. And so I think this is a really important uh, aspect in it. And so I, I understand Americans very well because I am one, and I understand why a certain kind of entrepreneurship works there that just simply doesn't work the same way here. So. I had this. I have this fantasy that I find a German business uh, archaeologist, and together <laughs> we understand what makes great. Uh, what's the mindset that creates great German businesses? Because they're here, obviously, and then we take those dynamics and figure out how do you apply those to digital innovation. Um, and I mentioned visual art just because I think in visual art, in I mean in art in general, you see a, the raw form of the psychology. Um, and maybe there's something to be understood. I mean, I was I'm very humbled having come from California, which has very little history, and I'm a horrible history student. Um, I'm also I'm often very humbled by what I don't know. So it's a lot of me kind of going, okay, I'm ignorant. I need to know more. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I noticed that you um, use quite like active language, and you say things like I manage a group of people or. Um, I was more experienced than X, Y, Z, um, which I super like admire. And these are usually kind of qualities or like ways of speaking that are not usually like associated to be like very female. Did you like along your journey? Did you have to kind of train yourself to, um, uh, yeah, to be more active and to maybe change a little bit of um, like, yeah, female ways of talking or too much giggling or things. Yeah, things that's yeah, I understand. Make, yeah. yeah, what you're asking. <laughs> so I think this is the American advantage uh, because we are absolutely taught to be confident and own what we do um, to a fault. I mean, it's it's problematic. Let's just face it. Uh, yeah, we have some things going on that reflect that maybe in our government right now. Um, <laughs> we could talk about that later. Um, but I think uh, I absolutely have. I mean. I have spent time looking at how how do I, especially as I've gone up in seniority, so language and small pieces of language make a huge difference. And uh, I'm, I mean, that's that's an ongoing process. So I work as part of an executive team now. And I notice uh, even small inflections where I th I'll say, I think, and my male colleague will say, blah, without prefacing it. I'm like, that's, you know, there's a differential there. 
Um, so I think this is an, oh, I just said it again, this is an ongoing thing that we all, you know, I, I don't think it makes sense for us to behave like men, but I do think it's important to be aware of what those differences are and then make a choice. You know, is it more important for me right now to really kind of um, up my game and, and meet this person eye to eye? Or I do this a lot, so I think it's actually more important for the situation that I create a space where it's okay to not be kind of this in competition with because we need to let the situation evolve on its own and it's not about dominating a conversation. I, does that answer your question? Yeah, totally. Okay. Hi, you've talked about how you um, created trust in your team. Um, I come from the business side of uh, my company and one of the main issues that we see actually in almost all the startups I've worked out is that um, there's kind of a mistrust between the business side and the tech side. Um, do you also have some kind of this magic formula on how you solved, uh, solved it in the past? I love this question. So this question is so important because this is, I believe, one of the key things that holds Europe back, uh, in my, you know, in my opinion. Uh, so where the U.S. is, is business people learn enough about tech to hold a decent conversation with a technology person and vice versa. What we need in Europe is to learn how to understand each other so that we can have a conversation and get rid of this wall. And we, 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 we're going through it at Zalando. So I run an interdisciplinary team. I have six business people on my team. And I built, I built the group last year, and I pulled a business team over from one part of an organization and brought it together with a tech team. And the first thing I noticed was there was a total power difference between the business folks and my data scientists. Business people thought the data scientists were always right, and the data scientists thought the data scientists were always right. <laughs> so the f you know what we had to do was begin to establish. Hang on a second. We all come here to solve the same problem, and we have different sets of skills that we come to the table with, and to create an environment where we understand when those when the business skills are actually take the lead in the discussion. This is, the, so this is the only silver bullet I have. There are moments when business needs to lead and there are moments when the technology side needs to lead. And if you can, if you can help people navigate that, then they begin, begin to respect one another and it's not about who has the superior wisdom. Uh, it takes time, but like I said, this, is, this happened in the United States after the first dot-com crash because all of a sudden there wasn't all this money and people were walking around going, okay, what happened? And business people recognized, oh, we didn't actually know what those engineers were telling us. And we invested all this capital in building systems we didn't need. And the engineers were like, that was a stupid business model. Why did I build? <laughs> so nobody wanted to waste their time, right? And they learned how to talk to each other instead of you know, living in a world that was divided by functional discipline. So this was one of the big surprises to me when I when I arrived in Europe and I think it's the thing that like I said it holds Europe back so if you can make a difference in the environment and I'm happy to talk to you afterwards if you can make an, a difference in the environment that you're in this is what's gonna one of the things that's gonna change the game <coughs> and just wanted to ask if uh, there is any lesson that you believe business people and entrepreneurs could learn uh, from music world Something that you brought from your um, composing background, from a totally different world, that helped you on the way. It's too easy to use the word iteration. Um, I think learning how to learning how to view an idea as it's just starting to take shape, and not demand too much of it. And this is an experience I went through with my business partner. I mean, we were just starting to hatch an idea and it really needed kind of more care and feeding. Um, and, you know, it didn't work for him, um, which was a good lesson for me in, in terms of like what to look for in a partner. Um, but as a business person, I think what you want to be able to do is, is figure out, well, what are the signs of a 
of potential. And then once you identify that potential, how do you how do you create a space to cultivate it so that it can grow organically without you demanding too much return too soon? And that's the creative process, right? That's mu I mean, you can't just. Uh, very few people can pour out like great works of music. There's, we know them, but they're like, you know, you can count them on a few hands. Cool. <laughs> 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 <laughs>